Good morning, and I wonder if I can get started. Is everything ready to go? In any case, good morning and uh, welcome everyone to the main session on sustainability and environment at the IGF 2023 in Kyoto. Sustainability really is uh, now one of the top priorities in every global agenda across all levels from all government, industry, and individual level. Um, like my organization, um, for, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Edmund Chung from Dot Asia, and also currently serving on the ICANN board. Um, so, one of the backgrounds um, in the last few years is that in, in 2020, when the uh, pandemic hit, the world really witnessed a, a, a very significant drop in CO2 emissions on record. Um, and that's primarily due to lockdowns and economic shutdowns. But alongside that, there was a huge surge in internet usage from Zoom meetings to grocery shopping online. And the attention to the uh, carbon emissions from the internet itself uh, kind of grew. But since last year, the lockdowns eased and the carbon emission actually bounced back very strongly to all-time highs. But the internet itself, of course, is ever more inseparable and the sustainability of the infrastructure itself uh, becomes an important question. And that's what this session is going to uh, uh, explore. What is, but what is the appropriate narrative um, to raise awareness and what are the actions to be taken? Um, you know, certainly it's not about uh, using less of the internet, right? Um, writing shorter emails or watching shorter videos really doesn't quite make sense. And on the flip side also, these uh, digital transformation and digital technologies have great potential in helping address climate change, helping address the issues. And perhaps the question is how we can do more um, and waste less. A key to both mitigating the damaging and uh, uh, the damage and unlocking the potential probably lies um, in better understanding complex and sometimes counterintuitive relationships between the use of these technologies and their impact on the environment. Many different organizations are working on the topic uh, at Dot Asia. We have just launched the, uh, an initiative which is called EcoInternet.Asia um, here in Kyoto. Earlier, um, we've launched it, and it, it is an effort to, um, together with APNIC and with the support from HBS and APNIC Foundation, uh, we've launched this uh, index uh, earlier this week here, uh, looking at measuring the eco-friendliness of internet infrastructures across different jurisdictions. Please check it out at ecointernet.asia or come to our booth um, with the big tiger um, at, um, at the IGF village. Wearing my other hat, actually, uh, the ICANN board, you can also see that ICANN is working on this, um, and you can see it from the CEO goals that have been set forward for 2024. It's goal eight uh, especially calls for the development of a comprehensive approach for, for developing and implementing an environmental sustainability strategy for ICANN. Here at IGF, of course, the work and the outputs of the policy network on environmental environment and digitalization, and then the subsequent work um, of the dynamic coalition on environment laid the foundation for strengthening links with the UN's ongoing work in the SDGs, which is what this session will be building on. So joining me on this panel are distinguished uh, leaders in the area, um, including David Suter, uh, an international ICT and development uh, expert often working with the APC. Mike Lucan at IEEE, chair of the Planet Positive 2030 initiative and a longtime advocate for sustainable development. Dolce Soares, uh, a civil engineer and a water sector leader at Simile Tech Company in Timor-Leste. Kemli Kamako, Camacho, sorry, uh, cooperative Sula Batsu, and has worked for 25 years in the development of feminist social solidarity economic alternatives in the context of digital society. And Makter Sek, Chief of Section, Innovation and Technology at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And Axel 
Clark, <laughs> my apologies, Axel Clarkerhe, from Director Economic and Social Development Digitalization with GIZ. So without further ado, um, David, please uh, tell us your work uh, and observation about the paradigm gap between the digital and environment policy making. David, over to you. So thank you um, very much uh, for the introduction and my apologies for coming in slightly late uh, to the meeting. I had to rush from another commitment. Um, I gather I've got about five to six minutes and that, that's what we should all be speaking for. So, in his, uh, this, uh, that was what we were told yesterday. So, in his speech on Monday, the, uh, the Prime Minister of the host country said artificial intelligence was poised to change the history of mankind. And that's also true, of course, of climate change. Uh, so what we do in relation to both of these things is crucial to our future. And I think we need to think about their relationship with one another. So I'll start with the fundamental problem, which is that there just isn't enough dialogue uh, or understanding between the digital and environmental communities of experts, communities of practice. Not enough discussion in environmental fora, like IPCC, of the impact digital technologies will have, but also not enough understanding in digital spaces like this of the environmental context and how it's going to affect the decisions we should make. So I'll start with by saying three things. Um, digital policies that aren't environmentally sustainable won't be sustainable in any other terms either. So we should be aiming for what I'll call an inclusive and environmentally sustainable digital society. And achieving that's not simple and it's certainly not guaranteed. Um, if we're to achieve it, obviously we have to maximize the contribution digitalization makes to mitigating environmental harms in other sectors, but we also need to minimize the environmental footprint of the digital sector itself. It's not a trade-off. This Both of these are fundamental and equally important. I'm going to suggest five reasons why they're difficult and then five policy approaches. I'll try to do this quickly, clearly. It's difficult because it's complex and it's much mis misunderstood. So, Sustainability is not just about the environment, it's about the interface between economic prosperity, social welfare, and environmental viability, and these often throw up different priorities. And environmental impacts from the digital society aren't just concerned with climate change. They raise at least three critical problems. So as well as energy consumption and climate, there's unsustainable exploitation of scarce minerals, and other resources, and there's growing volumes of e-waste, with little recycling, much dumping in developing countries. And then impacts are diverse, uh, some positive, some negative, all difficult to measure. So we need to consider not just direct impacts from the way we make and use digital resources, but indirect impacts arising from new types of activity like e-commerce, and the rebound effects that arise when efficiency improvements increase consumption and societal impacts, like the changes in the way we live and work and play. And these impacts differ greatly between countries. So many of the benefits of digitalization are being experienced in richer countries. More of the environmental burdens are being felt in lower income countries, particularly with scarce resources and e-waste. These impacts are certain to grow with AI and the Internet of Things, some good potentially, some bad all affecting those three critical areas of resource depletion, energy consumption, and waste. So any framework for the governance of AI, for instance, should have environmental sustainability at its heart. Now, I said I, I promised sort of five suggestions for improving governance, so let me make those now. So the first is to build much stronger dialogue between fora such as this and those concerned with the environment. There's a, there's a tendency in fora like this to promise digital solutions that look good to digital insiders, but haven't been tested out on those they're meant to help. And we need to listen more in fora like this to environmental experts and those dealing with environmental challenges on the ground. I'd actually like to see a main session here at the IGF that listens to speakers from environmental agencies talking about their priorities before considering what digitalization has to offer. And my second proposal is to build environmental sustainability into digital policy making at global, regional, and national levels. Um, UNCTAD is looking at how to make e-commerce more inclusive and environmentally sustainable in its next digital economy report. Other international organizations could do the same in their sectors, and governments should audit their digital strategies in pursuit of green goals as well as digital goals. 
My third proposal is about a circular digital economy. Um, so one that requires fewer scarce resources and less energy consumption, that extends the life of uh, digital devices and data centers, makes them more adaptable, encourages recycling and reuse, reduces waste. And there are responsibilities here for all, all stakeholders. So governments creating regulatory frameworks and introducing incentives, technologists and businesses designing things in ways that are environmentally responsible, citizens adopting more sustainable consumption. And so I tend to call this optimizing rather than maximizing digitalization. Um, and I recommend those who, who might want to follow this to look at the Digital Reset Report, which was recently submitted to the European Commission. Fourth point is to do with standards. Uh, standard setting bodies should include environmental factors in the development of standards. Uh, for example, reducing use of energy and scarce resources. And businesses should do the same when designing applications, networks, and services. My last point would be to do with monitoring what's happening, what's beneficial, what's not, so that we have an evidence base to build the inclusive and environmentally sustainable digital society I mentioned. For, uh, for businesses, I think that means being honest and transparent about their impacts with no more greenwashing. Um, but it also requires much more independent evaluation and analysis, which can and should be multi-stakeholder, can and should involve United Nations and other international agencies, and must cover all countries, not just those in which it's easy to measure things. So those would be my five proposals, and I hope five minutes. Thank you, David, and, and those are really important, um, I guess, suggestions, uh, and especially about the session here at IGF. And one of them is about standards. And so next uh, we go to Mike, uh, which is, will take us through a little bit more on what's happening at the uh, technical side with the, with the standards. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's uh, fascinating to be here and a great honor. Uh, let me introduce IEEE with a couple of words. It's the largest technical professional association with some 420,000 members around the globe in 190 countries. Uh, we are well known for many things, and one of them is 2,000 standards. And uh, if you happen to use Wi-Fi, you're using an IEEE standard 802.11. Uh, as part of its activities a couple of years back, the IEEE Standard Association launched an initiative looking at ethics and AI. Uh, that's not exactly what we're talking about today, but I thought I'd draw your attention to this document called Ethically Aligned Design, which is, I think, the first time that a technical association looked at ethics and standards. It's available for download for you. Um, <clears throat> then. Early last year, uh, we started a new initiative called Planet Positive 2030 with the goal to arrive at pragmatic recommendations to achieve planet positivity. We're using a multi-stakeholder consensus-based backcasting process with, uh, at this point, around 180 people involved uh, from around the globe, I think uh, 29 countries, if I recall correctly. The first draft compendium, Strong Sustainability by Design, is available for download as well. Uh, then following that, across the organization, uh, another initiative was called, uh, was formed, a SUSTEC initiative, uh, to further dig into the uh, recommendations from the Planet Positive Initiative to uh, arrive at uh, some identification of potential gaps in standards, technology gaps, road mapping gaps, etc. So uh, I'm pointing this out because this is an invitation to participate. So let me go then further on to our context. Safeguarding and more so achieving a truly long-term sustainable planetary biosphere, that's really what this is all about that we have a biosphere that sustains life of all forms 100 years from now, 2,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now. This is a big, shiny North Star that we are aiming for one way or another, maybe slowly, but that's what we like to see. 
So what do we need to do in order to get there? So we need to address global warming, or people call it climate change. That means achieving net zero GHG emissions and furthermore reduction of the greenhouse gases that are currently essentially imbalancing the composition of our atmosphere. So we need to get close to pre-industrial levels. That's the climate change agenda. Then we have the UN SDG agenda. We do need to achieve the SDGs. And then, harking back to David's comment, we do need a circular economy because we are resource bound. And we do need to address the waste that we are producing and leaving around. <clears throat> Ultimately, that means that every widget we build or use needs to be able to be demanufactured and, uh, if necessary, take the uh, materials down to the molecular level so that new, new widgets can be built from those materials. I like the term demanufacturing. We manufacture and we demanufacture. <clears throat> the fourth point here is the regeneration of ecosystems. We have done a lot of damage. We have to undo this damage. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will be exactly the same way they used to be, but they have to be healthy ecosystems. So essential to achieving this goal is looking at energy. And that was mentioned by both, my, uh, uh, both David and Edmund already. Um, accessible, clean, sustainable energy is the linchpin of uh, uh, this, uh, to, to address this problem or this complex set of problems. That means electrification of industry, different sectors, potentially the use of hydrogen, but ultimately we need accessible clean energy. We can solve the water problem with energy. Once we have clean water, we can produce food and so on and so on. Um, this is a global problem, but ultimately we need contextual solutions. One size does not fit all. And in some areas we can use geothermal for energy production, clean energy production. Uh, in other areas we cannot. That leads me to knowledge sharing. Once we have solutions, solutions and best practices and failures need to be shared so others can learn from it. Ultimately, we need what I would like to call a digital knowledge commons that very quickly shares knowledge to other communities to be able to apply it. The fourth point is standards work. Standards have been mentioned. Standards are essential for interoperability and I like to call it uh, standards started out with making, with describing how something works, then led to interoperability, then led to include safety, and today we need to include sustainability consideration in the development of standards. That means environmental, pollution, emissions, uh, demanufacturing, etc., including social implications of the use of whatever we are working on in terms of a standard. And we could also call that regenerative design or design for strong sustainability from the beginning, from the outset. It also requires system thinking. As I just pointed out, these various aspects to a standard, that's really holistic and system thinking. And what comes next is maybe the most important part, and that relates to where we are here at IGF, is accountability. We need to have metrics, we need to measure. We have to have the data collection, we have to agree on what the data collection is. We need to agree on how we, <clears throat> how we model. We need to be able to audit, we need to be able to uh, validate, etc. And so that's where I think this multi-stakeholder environment is absolutely essential to come to agreement on how we move forward on these facets to address these, this big, complex problem set. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and um, thank you for bringing up the AI and ethics. Um, actually, I also participated at the IEEE in one of those um, standards, uh, and I think um, uh, Anxer is uh, here somewhere in the audience. But one of the topics that uh, segues into the next uh, uh, speaker, Dolce, is about knowledge sharing. And uh, Dolce, please 
tell us a little bit more about uh, on the ground work on, on this topic. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you for having me. Um, as um, introduced before, I represented a local um, a t a technical uh, company uh, called Simili, based in Timor Leste. And I'm actually wondering uh, who are here know where exactly Timor Leste is? Okay, only a few. So, um, as I noticed, there's almost um, none of Timor Leste representative here uh, in such an amazing networking event. And um, I, I reckon I'm the only one here, and thanks to the APNIC ESIF Asia that are uh, giving me the opportunity to share the knowledge on the ground. So yeah, uh, before I start my session, I would like to briefly introduce a bit about Timor Leste. Where is Timor Leste? What are the situation there? In order for uh, the audience to understand the context of my speech today, Timor Leste is a Southeast Asian country, uh, a small state island that is situated between Indonesia and Australia, with a population of 1.36 million people. Well, we are relatively small, however. Um, our history is quite complex. We have over 500 or 400 uh, years of uh, colonialism, and that would mean the process of development uh, take long to come to this stage today. So we only gained our independence in 2021, uh, 2002, which is 21 years ago. While we are starting to rebuild our nation, other countries, um, uh, other emerging countries already are moving advanced with the technology and, and all other um, things to uh, build the country. Um, so with that, I would like to share a bit of the um, internet context or internet situation in Timor Leste. Uh, how does it look like in Timor Leste? So in Timor Leste, basically, the internet is very low speed. We, uh, the average uh, download of the internet itself is only around 4 to 4.5 uh, megabytes per second. That's very low compared to other countries. Um, we have limited infrastructure, including access to high speed broadband in rural areas. Um, it um, hinders uh, widespread internet adoption. We also um, only have 49.6% of the total population that using internet. Um, Timor Leste relies on the mobile connectivity and expensive satellite connection. Uh, we have the plan already, the government already have the plan for high speed internet through submarine um, fiber, uh, fiber optic connections. Um, uh, we're not sure when it's going to happen. But uh, in terms of the usage of the internet, mostly around the uh, work uh, for uh, email for work, and then uh, the community focus more on the social media usage. That's m the most popular one. They serve as a important communication channels and source of information. So moving on to the, the topic today about the environment and sustainability, I'd like to focus on the work that I've I, uh, been doing on the ground, more around the water supply, water resource management, and then climate change issue, and how these are linked with the importance of the uh, digital or technology intervention in, context, in the context of uh, Timor Leste situation. When uh, considering the process of rebuilding the nation in the water sector, the initial emphasis was uh, focusing on the water supply infrastructure, major investment on, on water, uh, water supply infrastructure. However, in 2015, um, Timor Leste got hit by the, I mean, the global crisis, El Nino, and that brought uh, water resource management to the forefront because um, there is lack of water resource management in Timor Leste, and basically all the investment are uh, focusing on the water supply itself. And then in 2020, La Nina happened, so that bring back uh, the importance of the uh, water supply. And how do we think, what are we going to do in order to integrate the water resource management and water supply system itself? Um, I also would like to share a bit of some of the challenges that um, happened in Timor Leste around the, the environment or the, the climate change issue itself. Most of the time, um, large and unsustainable investment into technology that only lasted as long as the project life cycle. And um, international agencies provide costly and unsustainable project-based support. Um, and these investments were often expensive and uh, highly technical. Uh, that involve uh, fly-in, fly-out uh, technicians, which are often uh, unaffordable by governments. 
Um, and this technology, especially within the context of the water sector, seemed to keep communities and government in the same place, meaning they did not foster growth of the further development. Um, at the same time, investment in climate change adaptation and uh, resilience programs often do not foster data sharing and collaboration as they are focused on only on the project-specific activities and outcomes. Now, with the limited resources that we have, international agency uh, disjointed and project-bound investments, as well as unsustainable technology uh, that hinder the growth of the development of the life cycle, this recreating the wheel of the um, response focus only initiative only uh, focus on the project base itself. So this is where the private sector comes in. Private sector comes in uh, uh, because um, there is slow process in the government uh, in terms of uh, waiting for the budget allocation, waiting for the, I mean, there's an intervention of the politi uh, po political intervention. Um, and hardly people involved in private sector in terms of the situation like this. And similarly, as a tech company, we um, come up with an idea, the technology innovation, where we collaborated with the local grassroots organization. This local grassroots organization, mainly they focusing on the water and land conservation, where similarly try to, I mean, the, the private sector try to collaborate in order to validate the work that this local grassroots organization has been uh, put over 20 years. The idea is if we can validate the efforts that they do, this could be information that influence the government in terms of the policy uh, decision making. Um, some of the examples that we do in practice is uh, when we're collaborating with the local grassroots organization, the technology that we have, somehow we, uh, we created the alert system where we inform the um, focal point of the local grassroots organization uh, to receive the alert system through SMS and email, and then they will then train the community in order to understand when the alert comes, what are these message means, and what are they going to do in terms to respond for the environmental issue. Giving a little example, um, for example, um, there is an alert about the water level indicator. If there are, um, I mean, the water level in the tank, uh, after three consecutive days, there, there is overflowing of the water, community will receive the alert system, and what they will do is better manage their um, water system. What they're going to do is whether allocate the time management for it or um, find alternative uh, options in order to cater the wastage of water to some other purpose. Now, on the other hand, for uh, information about the weather, they will um, normally in Timor-Leste, people cut and uh, slash burn the soil because um, they think uh, during the drought season, they will prepare to plan uh, for the rainy season to come. And that actually affecting the climate, uh, the, the environment itself. So with the alert system that we inform to the community, that will help them to sort of um, understand what sort of action, what sort of behavioral change that they could take in order to, uh, to change the way they practice, they, the way they practice usually, and then better manage their environment and as well as their water system. I guess I'll stop here and then I'll wait for the no, later th session. Thank, thank you, you. Dolce. I think you, you, you hit on a very interesting point. It's the sustainability of sustainability projects, <laughs> which is, um, um, and, and in Timor-Leste, actually, Dot Asia has been supporting a project there and my team was flying there. It's a beautiful country, so I, you know, Welcome to, to Tim Alessa as well. But that uh, the discussion about the sustainability uh, broadening to other aspects of sustainability is really what um, Kemli, uh, our next speaker, will, will talk about. Kemli, please. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you for the invitation to share table with all these amazing people and with you also. I'm going to read because we have only six minutes. Uh, I would like to contribute to the discussions with some of the reflections about the use of digital technologies for sustainable environment we have developed with organizations from the three social movements where we, as Sulabatsu Cooperative, participate. The indigenous women movement, the feminist movement, and the social solidarity economy movement. 
Because of the time restriction, I had select one or two of their proposals, demands, or call for action. Cosmovision, or worldview, is going to be the word to identify the proposals from the indigenous women movement. In relationship with digital technologies for sustainable environment, they would like to position the following concerns. Who is going to take in charge the waste produced by these devices installed around their territories? Our conmovision, they said, is not connected with this material, this waste produced by Okamasue, which is how they call the technology produced for or by white men, or the technology not produced by the earth. They call it Kamasue. How is it guaranteed that these devices for sustainable development or for monitoring climate, etc., are not surveilling our daily life if they are related to our natural resources, which are totally part of our practices, sacred places, and others. If they are collecting data from our territories and in our cosmovision, we can't separate body, water, and land. These data are our property. We claim ownership. They are talking about our lives. Care is going to be the word to identify the proposals from the feminist movements. In the discussion, they said, care for each person, for the collectives, and planetary care must be in the center of data processes and devices that are being used for environmental sustainability. Digital technologies working for climate change, natural resources, and sustainability must be contextualized. Data model must be correlated with power relationship, land distribution, economic dynamics, citizen participation, women action, etc. We as women and as communities demand for participating in the digital technology for sustainable um, environment, climate change, natural resources management process that are going to be developed in our context since the beginning, developing collective data models, designing technology solutions together ideating processes to integrate care as an axe of the digital environment solutions. Solidarity is going to be the word to characterize the social solidarity economy movement proposal and they have set. The possibility for humanity to survive is with solidarity. Digital technology can contribute or destroy the possibility for humanity to live in the planet. We claim for a responsible consumption of digital technology, in especially for, for rich countries, big enterprises, and well-connected population. Digital technology for sustainable environment must be developed and used in the right measure, in the exact balance between usefulness and negative impact. And that is only possible if solidarity is in the center of development. Digital technologies for sustainable environment must not only be data driven. There is a need to understand them also as technology to organize communities in risk and strengthening citizen participation. With collecting data about climate change, natural resources management, and other, it must be mandatory to strengthening citizen participation and organization. Then, from the social movements where we as Sulabatsu participate, we would like to ask for an urgent call to integrate respect for cosmovision or worldview, the focus on care, and the priority 
this session for solidarity as principles to develop digital technology for a sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, I think it, it's really interesting that uh, actually as all the speakers seem to have touched on um, changing at attitudes and changing behavior from, from some of the, uh, not only the actors, but the users is, is a, a really interesting uh, dimension. So next we go to um, Makter Sek um, and um, from, from the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Maybe talk to us a little bit more about how um, you know, this, this topic is being discussed there. Thank you very much. Thank you and good morning, uh, everyone. For, uh, thank you for inviting UNECA to be part of this important topic. As you know, the discussion about digital technology and climate change uh, become become very very important uh, at this stage why because digital technology has a positive and negative environment effect and we need uh, to take into consideration uh, this uh, this concern in our digital uh, policy and in general in when we define this national digital policy the issue of climate change is not very well highlighted in this uh, policy. Why at UN in the implementation of the African Digital Transformation Strategy, we support African country to put the issue of climate change in the policy, in the national digital, IC, digital policy. Why we do that? Because when we look at the statistic, when we have the statistic, uh, uh, digital technology uh, contribute to one, uh, one to five percent to the green gas emission, and uh, to the energy consumption is between five and ten percent. It's a lot. However, according to several study, this digital technology can reduce this green gas emission to twenty percent by two thousand thirty why it is important uh, to take this into consideration. In Africa, what are the key challenges we are facing uh, uh, to include this, uh, to take into cons this consideration, this uh, what dichotomy, digital technology, climate change? We have uh, several re 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 challenge. First, at the regulatory side. When we, look, when we go to the regulatory ICT, we didn't have uh, really this uh, relation between ICT, service, and impact environmental. We need to look at this uh, at the regulatory side. And there is also a misunderstanding of uh, several decision makers on the linkage between digital technology in and impact of environment. Also, the rapid advance of the technology hmm? Uh, can contribute to this uh, misunderstanding because we need to be to build the capacity to know exactly what are the impact of this new emerging technology in the, like artificial intelligence blockchain on the energy sector on the environment sector and to overcome with uh, some uh, uh, solution the other issue also we need to develop this uh, digital pro policy by involving all stakeholders. We can't develop now digital national digital strategy on digital technology without involving the environment sector, without involving the energy sector. We need to involve them and do not work in silo to develop this national digital strategy. It is very important. Now let me go through to some initiative we have at UNECA to leveraging digital technology for climate change adaptation. First, uh, at the policy level, when we support, when we develop national policy, we have an important component on uh, environment and uh, climate change to, 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 to promote uh, the, the contribution ICT to this, uh, to this uh, environment sector. Second, on on regulatory side also, we, we support uh, African country 
to change the narrative on the new regulation, to have a new regulation, including this, uh, this environment and climate change issue. Awareness. We, we have a several awareness initiatives. We, we organize every year what uh, one, one colleague, Akatong, on leveraging digital technology uh, for climate change adaptation. This Akatong, we, have, uh, we select uh, several young innovators across the continent. They come up for one, one week to develop key innovation on the climate change. And after that, we'll see how we can build hmm, some application around this uh, innovation on climate change adaptation. And uh, from this, uh, we support African countries to develop several uh, climate information system. Also, um, uh, some country also benefits of uh, benefits from ECA, from ECA support to develop some early warning system. She highlight uh, some in the in this country. I think it is something also similar in uh, Africa. Also, we support a lot of countries to develop this uh, um, uh, early warning system and the climate information system, and this has a positive impact now in the um, environment sector in, in the continent. Another issue also, it is a, when we do the climate information system, we, we, we should have an historic on the climate information. Now we are developing a, one application uh, starting uh, the historic of all information, uh, information regarding climate since 1990, uh, since 1920, yeah. And also we have a, Another big, um, very important uh, project now, we are working with DRC hmm, to develop a, a center of excellence on battery, on battery mineral. Also on credit carbon, we support uh, some African country to fast track the, the credit carbon register. We also have another important uh, project. Uh, uh, we work uh, on, on developing um, online platform because this online platform can also to mitigate uh, mm -hmm. the issue of uh, climate adaptation. The smart city also, also some application to reduce the energy consumption. I can, I think That's I- That's also part I, of the, uh, is that also part of UN's ECA? Yes. Oh. Well, at UNEC, we have uh, established a center of excellence on digital ID, digital threat, and digital economy. As the center of excellence is to support African countries uh, to use digital technology for achieving sustainable development and, uh, and the, the, uh, the achievement of the Agenda 2063 of African Union. But we focus on all activity related to this digital technology. We work related to digital technology, climate change, digital technology, health, also digital technology, digital economy, digital trade, and digital ID also. Platform digital ID will, ha will help also to mitigate this environment. Also, in the capacity building, we need to, to use this uh, emerging technology hmm, to mitigate this climate change uh, uh, adaptation. Why we, we are supporting, we, we already established a center of uh, a research center, African research center in Congo yeah. on artificial intelligence. Thank and one of the objective of the mission is to focus on how to use uh, artificial intelligence to mitigate uh, the climate change yeah. adaptation. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That's um, uh, thank you, Matt. I think it's a um, you know the the, the topic about uh, not being in silos and bridging that that gap between the sustainability side and the digital uh, side is is very important. And uh, that I think uh, next we go to Axel Klarke. Sorry, I <laughs> stumbled on on your name earlier, but uh, Axel, please tell us more about uh, the work at GIZ. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I also feel very much honored and privileged to be here now and to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts. Um, you were just saying uh, that there is still uh, this divide between uh, the sustainability communities and uh, the digital uh, communities. I would say that this is also our observation, that there is much room for bringing these two spheres much closer together, uh, probably on all levels. If you look at the global level, uh, we still see that uh, those communities discussing climate change issues are still a bit separated from us discussing here the architecture of the global digital systems. 
Uh, I think there's a few initiatives, though, that try to cross that bridge already. I just want to refer to what uh, ITU, for example, is championing now also for the upcoming COP28, uh, this green uh, digital uh, action track, which I think is a very valuable uh, initiative, and I can only congratulate ITU really for this uh, leadership and this uh, initiative. There's also another initiative that has not been mentioned here, but because David was also saying maybe it would be good to invite for the next IGF uh, some uh, leaders from uh, environmental agencies, there is already uh, under the umbrella of the United Nations an initiative called CODES, Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability, where there is indeed national environmental agencies and, and other really uh, very prominent actors from the environment sphere discussing uh, digital issues. So I think there is now some more initiative crossing those bridges, but I think even here in the context of the IGF, I would also love to see really more pure climate people maybe and more pure environmental people to tell us actually what they need from us and vice versa. I think this is maybe also my, my first message I would want to get across. Uh, so we need more cross-sector, cross-industry artists uh, that help us really uh, to shape that agenda properly. Uh, I think I would also want to agree on what the colleagues have just said on the necess necessity for more concrete standards. Um, I think what we sometimes shy away from in this debate, that sooner or later we must move from this general conceptual discussion and pilot projects to more binding regulation and, and, and to more clearer standards the industry would have to follow. I think to me this is very important that we support this idea. I know it's in the global context always uh, a dream. We don't have a global regulator doing this for us. But I think really making sure that we talk about the same things, the same standards, and the same terminology is extremely important. Uh, as he has said, we have also, you know, we have from our very nature, we are more uh, an agency that uh, implements projects in individual countries on certain topics, but we have also now recently pretty much engaged in, in contributing to that discussion. So we had an initiative with the World Bank and ITU uh, on standards for green data centers. I think that is a very useful uh, exercise. So we were sitting together with experts on how we can shape that. So the result is a practitioner's guide uh, for green data center that has been launched recently in Nairobi on the occasion of the Africa Climate Summit. And I think it was very welcome. That was my impression. Uh, and I think really towards this uh, direction, I would very much want us to invest more. We have also tried to instill in the GovStack initiative, I think most of you are probably aware of this, the, that is meant to contribute to this DPI, DPG agenda. Uh, in a very practical way also to instill uh, elements um, contributing hopefully to environmental sound rules for procurement, uh, for e-waste. I think those are really, I think, more those, those concretization what I think uh, are currently uh, really necessary and uh, we would probably want to see more of. I think that there is big potential, uh, I think goes probably without saying. Uh, and then in the complexity of the discussion, uh, and uh, this is also probably true for the discussion today, we have some people talking more about the greening of the digital industry, very much important. Green data center, I think, is just an example, but uh, this should probably also be expanded to uh, develop tools and instruments for the management of the entire value chains of the digital industry. So that would be, I think, also a good uh, idea uh, to develop it in this direction. And on the other hand, we have also people discussing more the potential and how, to, how we can unlock the full potential of the internet of digital technologies and tools to support the necessary transformation of the economy, to our economies towards really a carbon-free economy and, and really for the uh, end uh, um, uh, target really to cool down the planet actually. Um, here, of course, we also have lots of individual examples. 
Uh, what I think what we might want to add to that in the nearer future, again, is also maybe a place where we can have that proper exchange of knowledge and really draw proper conclusion that we could all subscribe to. So we have uh, brought forward an initiative that is called Fair Forward. I just wanted to refer to this because also we have through this gained some experience on how we can support partner countries in the global south. We mostly operate in Africa, also in India with this initiative on uh, AI in the realm of climate change adaptation. I think uh, what we have done there looks very promising. We have very interesting examples. So working on uh, watershed management, for example, so this is pretty close to what has been introduced here uh, already, so where we work with communities on, on using um, the results of AI and working with AI on shaping uh, management strategies for natural resources. We have in East Africa and Kenya initiatives uh, through this Fair, uh, Fair Forward initiative on AI, um, on uh, promoting uh, a climate um, uh, adaptation um, prone uh, activities in the agriculture, agriculture sector. So what I'm trying to say is there is, I think, already a good amount of projects and I think our next step should probably be really to draw the conclusions from this and then to push this agenda uh, forward. So my overall message, I think the, this discussion is extremely important. Uh, we are very much committed to contribute to that in, you know, on those various levels, the global scale, the regional initiatives like in Africa, UNECA or African Union, I think they really have a very important role, uh, plus on the national level, but I think what we still have to improve is this cross-sectoral nature and really how to cross that bridge. I think this is still something where we have room for improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. And, and the theme seems to be really crossing that bridge. Um, and I would like to open now to, to the floor. Uh, so please come, come to the mic. Um, and uh, for, for any questions, I see already a question, so I don't need my first question. So let's go to the floor first. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, microphone's working. Uh, thank you all for your val very valuable contributions. My name is Hannah Bouten. I'm the secretary of the Dutch Initiative for Sustainable Digitization. Um, I think uh, you cannot emphasize enough international cooperation on this topic. Um, and in that context, uh, I have a question, especially for Maike, since you were talking about standards. Um, indeed, we already have standards for uh, interoperability, safety, but where do we stand today, internationally, to develop standards for sustainability in our digital system? Thank you so much. Okay, Mike, I guess it's for you, but I guess others. Um, I think David and, and Axel might add to it as well. Please, please, Mike, first. So, um, from the IEEE point of view, standards are developed for global use. They are not limited to any jurisdiction. And uh, adaptation, of course, is uh, the question of uh, whether companies or governments adopt various standards and ultimately it can lead to regulation. So um, standards have developed at many different levels. So for example, there might be if there is a standard on how to integrate microgrids into uh, the larger grids today. There are standards on uh, um, energy efficient uh, wireless systems, etc. Like there's a long list uh, of many detailed uh, standards essentially to uh, have more sustainable infrastructure not necessarily referred to as sustainable, it's referred to as more efficient, etc. cetera. Uh, am I getting to your question? Yeah, so um, thank you for your answer. Um, I think that's very helpful. Um, so, but as already said, I, I, I think the necessity for the adoption of those standards is crucial to accelerate. Um, yeah, the sustainable digitization transition we have to make in order to contribute to preventing uh, the cl climate crisis to, um, um, I so, say that, get so, worse. So this work started, just starting on uh, trying to work towards a standard of uh, measuring carbon, a carbon footprint of a small organization, like a farm, 
a small company, uh, think of the fact that uh, over 90% of enterprises are small or medium-sized enterprises around the globe, but they bring in over 50% of the GDP around the globe. So uh, we don't have frameworks for these companies to participate in the quote-unquote carbon economy, carbon credits, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we do need those standards as well so that these small companies can ultimately participate in a uh, sustainable value, value chain, sustainable supply chain that will allow us to practice sustainable procurement. I'm firmly convinced that if we can get to sustainable procurement, we can solve a large part of our problems. Like, you know, and I think the European uh, suggestion of uh, product tagging, which is really the um, um, product pass, the digital product passport that's, under, that's committed to, but not quite um, designed yet, uh, is a huge step forward in what uh, Axel was referring to, a global uh, initiative, because it will have global impact like GDPR had, uh, to uh, get us uh, towards uh, being able to essentially vote with our wallets, us in individually, governments, companies, etc. So uh, I think your, your question is 100% uh, uh, at the core of the matter. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a final remark. I would really love to stay in touch and uh, straighten our cooperation. So I'll send you a LinkedIn invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Adding to that, I guess, um, uh, not only, well, enforcement is a big word, right? But uh, implementation of the, the standards is really, re really the key. And I think both, both David and Axel talked about um, furthering this discussion. And I guess IGF is one of those forums that, that can have this multi-stakeholder discussion so that implementation of these standards uh, could, could actually be carried out. I wonder if David or uh, others want to add to it. And as David is asking, I again uh, invite the, the audience to come to the mic uh, for the next question. David, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a phrase which I've heard a number of times here and which is becoming more current is responsible innovation. Um, and um, uh, that's uh, something that incorporates standard, standards bodies very importantly, but also encompasses a wider frame of reference. So it's about the innovation frameworks that take place in academia. It's about how businesses develop their uh, applications, products, goods, services, and so on. Um, and if, the, if you have that kind of concept of, a response, of an environmentally responsible innovation, you're unlikely to have innovations such as Bitcoin, which are uh, developed in a way which is not environmentally sustainable and therefore not economically sustainable either. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that I reiterate the point Mikey made about standards of measurement, uh, that we need consistent standards by which we are measuring uh, all of the things that are happening here at this digital environmental interface. We don't have those at the moment. It's like a common language that we can, we can talk about things as well. Mector, I think you want to add. Thank you very much. I, before I leave, I think uh, she touched one important point, the issue of the standard. I think is a is a future on what we are doing now in the digital technology to to mitigate this impact of uh, climate change. At the UN level, we already have this United Nations Framework Convention uh, on climate change to support African to support all countries to develop their policy strategy on uh, climate change, energy. But we need to 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 add this piece, uh, this missing piece on the standard. And I think it is a work we can uh, look at it at the, at the international level. We have this uh, ITU partnership for ICT. I think it is uh, something we can rise and to see how we can uh, develop standard, as well as we need to have uh, all this private sector to come on board to develop this standard because it's an issue of interoperability become, become cr cr crucial. And uh, IGF is a good uh, forum, a platform to start this discussion on the standard on uh, digital technology and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
So we go to the line, and I also see uh, a hand up on the uh, Zoom room. So, but please go ahead first. Yes, we received a very good question online, so I'll quickly read it out for you. It was questioned by uh, Izumi Ogutani, and she asked, what can we each do to strengthen the col collaboration between the environmental sector and the internet sector? Uh, and Megan Richard asked, added to that, uh, and maybe at a personal level as well. So I think that's mainly aimed at Axel um, to reply to. This is a very good question, but it's also a very broad question, isn't it? I think what we are doing is already towards uh, this, uh, this, this um, idea. Uh, I believe very much in, in uh, fora like this one, and I think we really need uh, to bring uh, the communities uh, closer together. I think this is something uh, we have already, I think all of us expressed in the first round, uh, so that we really have to intensify uh, those discussions. Uh, and then I think we really have to look deeper into the linkages between those two spheres. Uh, this is the technology, the standards, uh, so and 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 uh, many other things. Uh, so the the the, uh, the the side of the consumers, we have only a very briefly touched on the responsibility of consumers. So it has really different levels that lead also the involvement of, of different actors and again also different forms of regulation and uh, at the end of the day I really do believe this is not only a matter of talking and bringing people together, it's also a matter of defining standards, clear responsibilities, monitoring uh, and really uh, very responsible follow-up because the discussion I think it's not a luxury discussion we are having. Uh, I even feel very much a sense of urgency looking in this broader context of where we are in terms of climate uh, protection uh, and really this uh, acceleration uh, of the current situation uh, plus uh, negotiations that are not so easy uh, internationally. I would very much uh, admire and very much love this uh, digital community really uh, taking this issue up more prominently and more proactively. Uh, so that, that is something I think I would want to uh, yeah, come up with as an answer. Thank you. Thank you. And Kemli, you wanted to add to that? Yes, just um, wanted to, to complement a little bit on that. Um, I, I think it's crucial to connect with other social movements, other, yes, other movements, and especially with environmental movement that they have already a long path in the negotiation about uh, good practices, standards, and, and others, yes. And um, in, in my experience, at least in Central America, it had been uh, very difficult until this moment to really connect and uh, to really have a, a, an interaction between, between environmental movement and uh, digital right movement and uh, digital environment and all of that until now. Um, and, and I think we need to do the effort to really work together on that. And um, sometimes the environmental movement don't, don't, don't understand, doesn't understand very well our, con our concerns, and we uh, also are sometimes trying to do this path alone while there are other movements that have already advanced the discussions. Then uh, we, we always claim for the connection between movements uh, and uh, develop real uh, interaction and uh, try to build together uh, proposals uh, for the decision making, but also uh, for the communities. One movement that I always put as an example is the um, organic uh, agriculture movement, who really have developed some practices that I think is important to take a look and, uh, um, and have this example for, for the issues that uh, we are working on. Thank you, and um, I see a hand up, and uh, so I'll go there first and then come to you, uh, Chris. Dara J, please go ahead. So much. So my, yeah, my, my, my question is to Axel. So I thank you very much, Axel, that you have the initiative to, to, to leverage the potential of AI 
for environmental protection and management. And as you stated, you have, you have got really different projects on this, on this initiative. So as MACTA tried to state, UNECA is also supporting, you know, the establishment of the first AI research center in Congo Brazzaville, which could have an impact in, in, in just, you know, mitigating the, the environment or the, the, the climate change. So is there any proper channels that we could, we, could, we could leverage so that there would be really a kind of liaise between your organization and the research center we established for further, uh, you know, uh, implementing those uh, AI and emerging technologies, you know, for, for, for climate change? Thank you. Thank you. Are you pointing this to a particular center that, um, that you would like to ask? Or is it, is it free? Axel, you want I to I think I have, uh, you know, uh, read your question now in a way that uh, you would want us to, to explore uh, possibilities for collaboration. And I can uh, just answer that we are more than ready to, to look into that. Uh, I think all of those initiatives can only be successful if we really think it as, a, as partnerships, as, as something we do not just as one, you know, separate institution or organization and the other institution is also doing something. Uh, I was already trying to say that I really think in this discussion of AI application in, uh, on, on climate change protection, I do believe there is a need to exchange more on experiences, on, on, on results, and, and how we really want to push this uh, agenda further. Uh, so just contact me, uh, and then I will connect you to our uh, teams and, and our experts, and we are more than ready to discuss. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, thank you very much, Edmund. Um, Chris Buckridge. I'm a technical community representative on the IGF MAG, and um, for full disclosure, I was involved in organizing this session, so I want to thank all of the speakers for their participation. It's been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, I want to change hats slightly, though, um, with to make a comment and to, to ask a question. And I think the comment relates to some of the questions we've already had about the role of the IGF and internet governance um, structures and what they can do to connect more with the environmental policy making and, and discussion. Um, and I wanted to shift the focus a bit to the national and regional initiatives. So thinking in terms of the IGF as a broader ecosystem, which also includes regional and national IGFs, of which there are, there are many, as we've heard. Um, and so I've been involved quite heavily in Eurodig, and I know there's been a number of um, sessions and workshops at the, that European IGF level um, on this topic over the, the last few years. I know APR IGF has also had a number of sessions, and I'm sure there are others in, in other parts of the world that I'm less aware of. Um, but I think that's a really useful opportunity to connect, and this is kind of in, t in relation to what Dulce and um, uh, Kemley were saying, at the more local level and with those sort of smaller grassroots organizations and, and um, private sector organizations that are doing that work um, and maybe you're not going to come along to a big annual IGF event but might be able to connect with the, the local communities that are involved in internet governance. So having that connection at that level is really important. Um, in terms of the question, I wanted to build a little on the, the workshop at this year's Eurodig and give a very brief report there, uh, because the topic we were looking at was in relation to do, do policymakers actually have the level of understanding that they need to be making policy with an environmental concern, but towards the digital sector. And I think Mokhtar, um, who unfortunately had to leave, but made that comment about the confusion that sometimes might exist between in, around the link between ICTs and digital um, activities and environmental impact. And so in Eurodig, we were looking at a number, we were looking at AI, certainly, um, and I know OECD presented there. They've also done some work. I think that probably complements the work that IEEE has done. Uh, we were looking at data centers and, and streaming, and there was, that's certainly a very big discussion in Europe at the moment, the link between data centers and increased sort of data throughput and what that means for energy usage, whether there is a sort of 
direct linkage or whether the linkage is a little bit more um, complicated. <laughs> Uh, and then also looking very briefly at the quantum internet and what that might in, how that might impact. So I guess the question I wanted to throw open is, is do you as on the panel see uh, a need for better information for policymakers in relation to environmental impact? Uh, and can the IGF, both at the global level but also the sort of more regional and national level, help to foster that? So policymakers, same as us, can never have too much information to base evidence-based decisions on. The other thing I'd like to point out is whatever was true 10 years ago is not necessarily the best solution today. So one of the things that we have to deal with in terms of informing policymakers and, uh, is, is really um, to keep people up to date of what today's ultimate or close to best uh, solutions are. And we have to be willing to re-examine this in a year or two or three, depending on what is going on. And as far as I'm concerned, development of regulation and development of policy is far too slow. Like it doesn't keep up what is happening in, in the industry, what's happening in technology. We, like in 2007-8, we had dire predictions about how much power ICT would use. Now, ICT power use or electricity use has gone up, but certainly not in the way it was predicted way back then. Um, if you look at the nuclear industry, the big strides are being made with small um, modular uh, reactors uh, that could potentially solve the, uh, um, certainly the, the issue with uh, pro uh, providing remote communities with, with uh, clean energy. Um, and uh, like I can go into a big long debate about that. Uh, truly uh, exponential strides have been made. And so policy has to be, or policy makers really have to be kept up to date. We actually need a better way to do that. There's one, I typically, USA is doing it for the Congress once a year, but, and to sometimes in between. Uh, but um, I think the channels need to be opened up much more. Thank you, and I think David wants to add, and I'll add myself to responding. Um, just firstly, uh, reinforce Chris's point about the NRIs, and the UK IGF had a major focus a couple of years ago on environmental issues. It, which was uh, introduced to a keynote from an advisor to the IPCC, uh, which focused around circular economy issues and, and so forth. And I think there is a scope there. My disappointment with that is that so few people actually take part ultimately in that sort of forum and it needs to reach out further. Um, on the broader policy issues, I think um, a lot of discussion uh, around this tends to focus on what can happen in ideal circumstances if the best technologies can be used in, uh, uh, with the right policy commitments. But actually what matters is what will happen in real circumstances which are never close to ideal. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of aspiration for what might be achieved. It needs a, a healthier dose of realism. And I think a lot policymakers' perceptions in the digital sector uh, of what is happening in the environmental context are often outdated and vice versa. Uh, so that's a, an important reason for bridging it. Uh, CODES, which Axel mentioned, is I think an important UN initiative in this context. And again, I think the, the, the European academic network that built the Digital Reset uh, Initiative is also uh, an important one to look at. Thank you. I'll, I'll add a little bit and pass to you, Kim Lee. Um, I guess that's really the, the, the yeah, I see two, two um, persons on, on the mic as well. Just, just quickly, that's why we, we published the Eco Internet Index, and, and to add to that uh, uh, discussion, we need information. We need to know whether of certain ways of measuring uh, the, the impact is an appropriate way to measure the impact, balancing between digital transformation and the, I guess, the digital carbon footprint. So, but Kemli, and then I will go to the two uh, questions. Very quickly, um, we, we, we think at the local IGF, 
it's uh, really, really a need to integrate other voices from other movements to discuss the, the um, internet governance and to discuss these, these key, key problems. Uh, I have been working on, on IGF, uh, in the local IGS for, I don't know, for 50, I don't know, 10, 12 years, I don't know, and in the regional one also. And we always try to integrate more voices from other sectors. I think this discussion is not only our discussion. We, I think we really need to integrate other actors in the discussion, environmental movement, the indigenous movement. They have to be here discussing with us, and that has to begin in first in the local IGFs, then this discussion has to be, has to be open, has to, be, um, have, has to integrate other actors and other voices. This is one, one thing. I, I, I have to say something because the time is, uh, is about to finish and I don't want to leave uh, this, uh, this issue um, um, while uh, we, we have extractivist business model in the base of our digital society, it's going to be very difficult to really take a balance in the use of the digital technology between the usefulness and the, the and the, and the bad impact on the environment. I, I wanted to say that and we had some discussion in this IGF about the extractivist business model in the base of the digital society. And uh, then uh, this is one of the discussion we have had inside the, the indigenous movement, feminist movement, and uh, feminine movement and social uh, economy movement, yes. While we have this model, and then is, is there is a need to create other business models and to develop other business models with other references uh, to really have the possibility to use technology uh, and uh, without such a big impact in environment. And I wanted to say that also. Thank you. Um, I, so I'll, I'll go to the, uh, the, the, the ones in the, in the mic first, and I don't know if Izumi Okitan, Okutani you want to add as well. I've, I'm not sure whether Chat or Kino was first, but I'll go with Chat, Kino, and then Jasmine, and then see if uh, Isumi would want to add, and then we'll come to uh, please respond, and then also include your closing remarks looking at the time as well. So Thank Chat, you. please. Thank you. Um, my name is Chat uh, Garcia Ramelo from APC. So yesterday we had a lightning talk, and we had two people from our network to speak of how, what they're doing in relation to e-waste. And one of the things that came out, so one from India and the other from the Gambia. And these are small organ these are organizations that are trying to contribute so that the, the impact right, of e-waste is not um, uh, is diminished, at least in their communities. And this is really looking at what your uh, for example, what David was talking about. We produced through the network a, mod, uh, a toolkit. Um, uh, on circular economy, working with different, um, you know, um, organizations or members of the network. And I think this is a, I, I, I raised this, uh, so one of the points that came up there is that we know that 2.6 billion need to be connected. And 2.6 mil billion means more gadgets and more resources. So I just wanted to, and that sort of struck me, in, struck us in the sense that we, there are many different things we can do. And I do think that perhaps one thing that we are able to do is to really maybe highlight more the stuff that works now. I, and I, 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 to, to David's point about it cannot be, it, you know, it has to be pragmatic or realistic. So things, there are things I think that we can do now and that works now that might have much more impact. Um, and I, I do think that's maybe something we can contribute, we can do together and, uh, and look at what it is that, that, that really works, where we can, you know, collaborate on. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Kino. Hello, uh, my name is Kino. I'm a vice president of Internet Association Japan. My comment or question is about the standard, uh, which uh, I completely concur the importance uh, for in this context. 
That said, uh, uh, I heard the, the, the comments from a couple of uh, speakers uh, earlier that uh, the, um, with respect to the uh, sustainability and the digitalization, uh, there is a room uh, for two uh, separate domains to converge together, uh, come together, uh, to understand each other. So my comment and the question is that the before uh, getting on the actual standardization uh, uh, to be developed, uh, I do see the necessity of uh, uh, developing a practice, how the digital uh, technology will contribute to uh, the, uh, accelerating uh, the, uh, the environmental uh, uh, protection and uh, also sustainability. So uh, question to <laughs> the, the panel is that, uh, do, do, do you also uh, uh, see the uh, similar necessity on, on uh, opportunity to work on the practice development before uh, uh, taking on the initiative on the standards for this uh, matter? Thank you, Gino. I'll go to Jasmine and then I'll go online to uh, Izumi and then we'll start from Dolce over for, for the, the response and closing remarks. Jasmine. Oh. Thank you, Edmund. So um, this is Jasmine. I'm from technical community and youth from Hong Kong. So I focus more on data collection and center and standards as well. I really fond of the idea of system mapping and also seeing the gap of mobile mapping. So my, um, my observation and also uh, my question will be, because um, we are all like from different regions, we, do, we have our own standards and the way we collect data. But the thing is like when we come on this platform, um, we, we need to have, I just feel like we need to have more visualization or really a same centralized platform or database that we could see how we each other reckon on, each puzzle, how we could collectively see the impact that we're making at the same time. So um, I just wonder, like, how do you see your role in your circle of influence or circle of concern that you, um, you know, like um, measuring data of a technology on uh, with its environmental impact? Because I really want to, um, that tackle the, the, the gap about the roadmap and also the things that we've been talking, you know, for, for a while. So I, I, I feel like I see the need of accelerating the um, um, discussion and also like the way we uh, share and collect data, share information together as a, as a, as a group. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Izumi, did you want to, are you able to unmute and add? Izumi, is, is it that you need to, um, I don't know, the administrator, please unmute uh, Izumi Okutani so she can speak. If not. Thank you. Um, this is Izumi Okutani, and um, sorry, it took a bit, bit of time for unmuting. A uh, very interesting discussion, um, and I especially like the point about having some uh, platform for information sharing between uh, different players. And I think in the earlier context, um, there was more focus on providing information for policymakers. And I would like to add that in addition to that, uh, putting more um, focus on industry players, uh, what can each of these um, businesses and um, internet communities can take actions can also be helpful, not just for policymakers. And in that context, um, I think um, having some, like in addition to regulations, I think having some milestones and guidelines on what actions that um, each industry players can take can be really helpful. So in order to do that, uh, national and regional IGF, I think would certainly be helpful as a place where um, these uh, players can actually uh, come to obtain information. But I think there needs to be more additional efforts to be put into so that the discussions and information sharing doesn't just stop at the IGF forum, um, but it actually reaches the, the businesses and the technical community as well. Thank you, Izumi. And one last intervention, very short, please. Thank you. Given that this is the last one, I'll make it very brief. Uh, my name is Elaine. I'm based in Singapore. I participate in this as an individual today. And as a citizen of the global, uh, around the world, I'd like to make a few points. 
First of all, we live in a city where there are very few choices and of sustainable living options and all. And second is about education. Now, I attended the United Nations Staff Systems College on sustainability of lifestyles and also digital for sustainability. What I'm trying to call upon is whether we could have policymaker to provide more incentive and education for citizens because that's the fundamental of all the people, the population that will embrace that, the way they consume and commute and many more. So thank you. Thank you. Now I'll go to Dolce and uh, across to, to David for, for your closing remarks. Yeah, please. I guess my closing remark, um, as you can hear, probably I'm the one who less talking here because I'm coming from all the way from a country, uh, in the developing country, when everybody talking about AI, high technology policy makers, we're just starting uh, talking about digitalization. And um, when we talk about digitalization uh, back in our country, our focus is more looking at the best practices that are available in the country and what can we learn from the best practice itself how do we integrate technology with the best practice that are already available in our country? And then how do we educate our people by providing capacity building, regardless what sort of technology that we have, but um, how do we make sure that the technology that we um, deploy uh, within the country should or must ensure that uh, the understanding of the user of the technology itself? And on the other hand, I also would like to sort of um, um, inc uh, provide sort of like a comment around the, um, maybe in this sort of platform, IGF can help to influence uh, a more inclusive environment among sustainability actors by encouraging, um, um, uh, as uh, Azumi mentioned before, like a more business people, private sectors, government and international agency collaboration. So we can hear many aspects of, uh, di from different sectors uh, that can provide their inputs around the technology and the internet. Is the, environment itself. Thank you. I think that's for me. So please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so there were so many uh, complex questions, so I will probably not answer those now in one minute. Uh, I think what, what I uh, found very obvious in the discussion now, I think when we want to explain that complex issue better to decision makers, I think we have to make it uh, simpler. Uh, and clearer in terms of priorities. Uh, I do believe that this is really something uh, most likely we want to do next, really clearly making the point for, I don't know, 10 points of action or maybe even less so that really the decision makers can understand what is actually urgently needed. Sometimes we tend in the discussion to add again, a new layer of complexity, and for a decision maker, it's not so easy to disentangle that and to really derive a conclusion that are relevant to their sphere of action. I think that is something uh, I do believe we should work on, making things clearer, also making clear, sure that we all have in mind the same big trends. I think also the trends have been mentioned. So what is coming up in the next 10 years? We have heard about uh, still the 30% of the world population being unserved, not having access. So this is going to change, again, with dramatic consequences for the environment. So we also have currently only a lower percentage of data centers being located in the global south. Again, this is going to change with massive uh, implications in terms of sustainability. And and so forth and so on. So this is, I think, just a few examples of, I think, of what we should follow up on. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you. Well, thank you. So this was a very interesting panel. I mean, I've learned a lot, and it has been a lot of fun. Um, so in, in, it's a little bit of a takeaway. So as we kind of move forward and build and implement a pathway to a sustainable planetary biosphere, and I stick to the term, um, because it's much more than just the environment. Uh, we do need, and we have talked about this, uh, multidimensional collaboration and cooperation across jurisdictions, sectors, civil society, all are essential so that we can agree on accountability frameworks. We don't even have that for large companies yet today. We need to measure and be accountable and be ready to revise decisions. We need to measure our impact, be accountable, and be ready to revise. 
we also have at our hands what I would like to call a wicked problem, or maybe more than one. Like, it's very complex, and uh, we have to deal with competing interests, or actually competing needs at the same time. The urgency of today's problems versus the urgency of tomorrow's problems. And so, one of the, this is one of the big items that will require fora like this to debate what, how we can keep the balance, how we can address those needs. And then I'd like to say that as we move forward and build a sustainability culture, that we take into account for every project, everything we do, what we need to do in terms of sustainability. And we cannot leave anybody behind. And I like to say failure is truly not an option. Certainly not. Please, tell me. Okay, thank you very much for all the interventions. Uh, I think that is really, really valuable, all the discussion here. Uh, we, we, we talk about uh, four steps. The first step is integrate, in, integrate integrate more people in the discussion, more movements, more, more uh, thoughts, uh, more generation, etc. in this discussion. The second one, understand better. We think this complex problem, we, we, we need to understand better what is happening. Uh, the idea about uh, this common platform is very interesting, but another, another possibility to understand better what is happening, how is happening, uh, who is producing all the situations. I think we are beginning with that, uh, to, to be honest. The third point is disseminate and create movements around, um, around uh, what is happening in the digital society with environment. Uh, and, I, and we prefer to talk about the digital society and the environment, not the digital technologies. And the fourth one is change practices. We really think we need to change practices. We need uh, to to really put on the agenda the right measure. I don't know if the translation is good in Spanish. We talk about la justa medida, which is the, the fair measure between the utility and the destruction. Uh, I, I began to work in all of that 25 years ago, I remember. And at, at 25 years ago, I claimed and work hard for connectivity, for connection to everybody. Uh, and now, 25 years later, I claim for less connectivity for the very well connected and more connectivity for the ones not connected. Then uh, I think that changed a lot the perspective of the digital society. Thank you. Thank you. David, please. Um, Okay, so one of the problems here is that for every individual actor uh, in an environmental context, they, every individual actor thinks that their own actions make only a marginal impact on overall environmental outcomes, and so they're not really that important. And that's a reason why the governance structures around this are critical. Um, so government, uh, government structures of, of regulation and to create incentives for environmental responsibility uh, the ways in which businesses develop products and services and, and in which standards are developed and so forth. Um, the way in which citizens can... Um, well, the, the kind of information around the overall environmental context that is available to citizens and the information that they can take to make environmentally responsible choices as consumers. So all of those things, I think, are, are what I would sum up as, as saying, we need an ethos of environmental responsibility across the digital sector. So the decision makers at all levels in government, business, standard setting bodies, uh, data centers and so forth are, making, uh, are taking into account the environmental impacts of what they do. Thank you, David. And I've run totally over time, but um, I think there's a clear consensus that this is a journey, um, and there is willingness to continue this, this dialogue, and there is this gap between 
uh, there's this gap that while citizens may not be uh, able to make a big impact, I think it's still important for each citizen to work on, on it. And the other thing is there's a clear direction action point as well is for this community to go back to your NRIs, the National and Regional Internet Governance Forums, and bring those stakeholders that matter, bring the governments, bring the ministers, the right ministers, bring the uh, industry to talk about this issue. And I expect everyone to go back to your national and regional initiatives and do that. And then next year to come back at this main session and tell us about what, you know, what further actions uh, we, we can take on this very important uh, matter that we cannot fail to um, accomplish. Thank you, everyone. And please join a round of applause to the panel.